Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Jesus Christ is our life and light. In his name and in his power, let us worship God. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Welcome to the Hopewell Reformed Church. We're so glad you decided to worship with us tonight to celebrate this sacred night. This is a special night. This is a holy night. Please wish someone else next to you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. prayer that's written in your bulletin. Let's pray together. God of creation, your word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Your son became human and taught the world to sing a new song of joy and praise. May we hear the good news of your salvation this night and then go forth to proclaim your promise of peace to the ends of the earth. Amen. This is a story of the angel Gabriel's visit to Mary. The angel tells her that she is about to bear Jesus, who will be the Son of God. Mary is assured of God's favor and that this pregnancy is the work of the Holy Spirit in fulfilling God's promises. 
Hear the word of God as it is written for us in the gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 30, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. may be seated. This is a reading uh, Mary offers a song of praise to God. 
God who looked on her in favor and who has lifted up the weak and brought down the powerful. Hear the Gospel of Luke. Pray with me. O oh God, Mary opened her heart to you and she bore your son, a savior of the world. Like Mary, we open our hearts to you to receive your son so that we may open all our doors to welcome all peoples as sisters and brothers in your household. Amen. A reading from the Holy Scripture, Mary's Song. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor in the lowliness of his servant, Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown his strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thought of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Here ends the reading. Please join me in the prayer written in your bulletin. Let us pray together. God of gladness and joy, 
You give strength to the weak, food to the hungry, and hope to those who live in fear. Make us join, to join in your holy work, that all who are hungry this night might be full, and all who are afraid this night might live in peace. Through our Savior Jesus Christ, amen. In this reading from the story of Jesus' birth, Joseph discovers that his fiancée, Mary, is pregnant, but an angel comes to Joseph and tells him not to fear, that this is the work of God. The baby is to be named Jesus, which means the Lord saves. Hear the word of God as it is written for us in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus.
Please join me in prayer. Shepherd of Israel, may the name Emmanuel, God with us, be more than just a dream in our hearts. Let us see your salvation in the world around us, that we may praise your name forever. Amen. In this next scripture reading, Jesus is born amid difficult human circumstances. A census decreed by the emperor requires Mary and Joseph to travel to Bethlehem, the city of David, to be registered. Hear the word of God as it is written for us in the gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. shepherds 
and they announced the joyful news of the Savior's birth. And then the shepherds go to Bethlehem because they want to see the child for themselves. Hear the word of God as it is written for us in the gospel according to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Amen.
Please join me in prayer that is written in your bulletin. Let us pray together. Holy God, heaven and earth met as angels sang to shepherds. You shared your glory with the humblest people of Bethlehem that night. Before your glory tonight, may both rich and poor stand amazed. Amen. The Gospel tells us about the events that took place after Jesus was born. Wise men from the east are guided by a star and come to worship a child born to be king. In this story, both the Hebrew scriptures and the dreams of many other people are fulfilled. Hear the word of God as it is written for us in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where, the, where is the Messiah was to be born? They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent, to the, sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Thanks be to God.
in your bulletin. Bright morning star, you guide us to strange new places. As we journey on toward your light, grace us with the hospitality to open our hearts and homes to visitors with whom we may share your gifts and by whom we may be blessed. Amen. The Gospel of John tells us more about the meaning of Jesus' birth, the creative power of all life. The Word of God took on flesh and came into the world when Jesus was born. Hear the Word of God as it is written for us in the Gospel according to John, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of the pe all the people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. A hymn to God's word, who is the expression of God's very being and the creative power of all life. This word has become human and lived among us. We'll now receive our tithes and offerings. For those of you who are visiting tonight, there's an insert in your bulletin, and we invite you to fill out this information and drop it in the offering plate. Let us worship God.
Please join me in the prayer which is written in your bulletin. Let us pray. Generous God, you did not spare your only son, but gave him to us to live and work among us as a sign of your grace. May the gifts we give be signs of grace that light the way to Jesus, the gift from whom all gifts come. Amen. Well, I love Christmas. Christmas is my favorite holiday. I especially love the giving and receiving of gifts at Christmas. But I want to share with you a story of a debacle of gift giving one Christmas in our family. We always had to wait until Christmas morning before we could open our presents. Some families have the tradition of opening their presents on Christmas Eve, but we opened them on Christmas morning. We had to wait. And as we went down one morning, I was a teenager. My brother was about 13 years old. We looked at the presents under the, under the tree, and my brother went like this. Oh, no. And we said, what? He said, I forgot to buy gifts. <laughs> 13 years old, he got on his BMX bicycle and rode down to the gas station and bought gifts for us all. He bought my father a TV guide. <laughs> Never mind that my father already had a subscription to the TV Guide. <laughs> he bought my mother a small box of powdered donuts. He bought my sister a can of Sprite. And he bought me a Snickers bar. <laughs> and actually, as I think back on it, it's kind of endearing that a 13-year-old would even think to go and buy gifts, even if it is on Christmas morning. But a few years ago, he was reflecting on that and said, I, I really failed that Christmas. He said, I, I missed the point that Christmas. He said, I know giving is all about, um, it's about the joy in giving. It's about love and giving. It's about, it's about giving from your, from your heart with thoughtfulness. And, and I missed all of those things. I missed Christmas. I missed the point of it. Well, I have to admit, there was a year when I kind of missed the point a little bit, too. I gave my dad the nine-volume box set of Ken Burns' documentary special on the Civil War. And I knew he would love it because my dad is a buff, a Civil War buff. But I have to admit, I bought it for him because I really wanted to see <laughs> the nine box set of the Civil War documentary series by Ken Burns. Sometimes, especially when we're living in the same household, we have to, we have to uh, resist the temptation to buy gifts that we hope will become communal property. <laughs> but my dad was just as guilty as me because one year when I was eight years old, my parents bought me an HO scale train set, and my dad was way more excited about that train set than I was. I was pretty excited, but he was more excited. He played with that train set more than I did. But the story that takes the cake, I think, from my past that I remember about kind of missing the point about gift giving on Christmas was my friend Tim's sister, Maureen. And what Maureen did is she, about a week before Christmas, snuck downstairs and she found, late at night, the gift that her mother had given her, one of the gifts from her mother. And she carefully unwrapped that present and she opened the box and to her dismay and discouragement, what was in the box was a blouse that was so far out of style that she would never wear it. But as she looked through the box, she saw something else, a gift receipt. And an idea occurred to her. So she took the blouse and the gift receipt, put it in her school bag. The next day after school, she returned the blouse, got a very trendy shirt that she loved, went back that night, carefully folded that into some, um, into some paper and wrapped it in the box, actually wrapped the box perfectly with the same paper to make sure the tape was even in the same spot and carefully placed it in the same spot under the tree and on Christmas morning, Maureen opened the box and she held the trendy shirt up to her shoulders and said, thank you, mom. This is exactly what I wanted. Thank you. And her mother, looking perplexed, said, you're welcome, honey. She said, I, I'm not, it's funny, I can't remember buying you that shirt. Sometimes we, we do miss the point of Christmas. In these stories from the scripture that you just heard read, there were two people in particular who missed the point of Christmas. 
One was King Herod. King Herod became jealous of Jesus' power, and so he, he missed the point. But the other was the innkeeper. We heard it in the scripture that Phil read for us tonight. It simply says there was no room for them in the inn. It came time for Mary to give birth, but there was no room in the inn. Now we know that the census was taking place, so the town was crowded, the hotel I'm sure was crowded, but if that innkeeper had known that his unborn savior was standing there in front of him in Mary's womb, I'm sure he would have made room in the inn. But instead, he passed them along. And what I want us to reflect on tonight is how our lives are so busy and our hearts are so full of other things that sometimes I think maybe we also have no room in our hearts for Jesus, no room in our lives for Jesus. And so what would it take for us to make room? Well, the first is I think we have to empty our hearts. I read a quote this week from a famous theologian and preacher named Dwight Moody, and he said, I firmly believe that we have to empty our hearts so that we have room to let Jesus in. He said the things that we have to empty our hearts of are pride and selfishness and ambition and all of those things that are contrary to God's word. And then, he said, the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. But if we're too full of pride and conceit and ambition, then there will be no room for the Spirit of God. So we must be first empty, Dwight Moody said, before we can be filled. He was referencing that passage from Galatians chapter 5, which gives us a list of the things that are not healthy when they exist in our hearts. Things like jealousy and hatred and rage and selfish ambition and dissensions and factions and envy. But then Galatians goes on to give us a list of the things that will exist in our heart if we do make room for Jesus, if we let him in. It's the gifts of the Spirit. You'll find that you'll start to be full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. But how do we make room for Jesus in our crowded lives? And so I want to give you five very quick practical suggestions. One is we have so many activities in our lives. We are busy with work, with yard work, with all of the hobbies and activities that we do. The idea is not to do away with our activities. The idea is, how do we invite Jesus into our work? How do we invite Jesus into the things that we're already doing? Work can be seen as a mission. Everything that we do is a mission to God. So invite Jesus in. That's number one. Number two, my wife and I take time every morning to pray. We pray with each other and for each other. She tells me what she needs prayers for. I tell her what I need prayers for. We hold hands. We pray together. And we also pray for Sonia. And we pray for our unborn baby. And we pray for Jesus to come into our lives to be with us that day. So just simply invite Jesus into your day. That's the second thing. The third is when you pray to Jesus, come exactly as you are. It's interesting in that phrase that says there was no room in the inn. The Greek word for inn is kataluo. And it literally means the place where you unburden your donkey. The place where you take the packs off of your donkey, unburden yourself. That's what kataluo literally means, the place of rest. Later in the gospel, in chapter 11, Jesus says, he describes himself as that place of rest. He says, I am the one who unburdens you. Give me, give me your burdens. If you're weary or heavy burden, give me your loads, and I will give you rest for your souls. So how ironic is it that the one who would be the place of rest is turned away from the place of rest? But that's the third thing. Come to Jesus exactly as you are, where you are. Give him your worries. Give him your concerns. Just give him your burdens. The fourth is to quiet your heart. And that's simple. Just take five minutes, set a timer on your phone, forget about everything else, forget about your schedule, and just put aside some time to open your heart to Jesus. And the final is to simply, number five, simply invite Jesus in. We have to invite Jesus in or Jesus won't come in. 
Jesus, God, is not a God that imposes himself on you. God is a God that will only come into your life if you want God in your life. If you say by your actions, my life is too full, I don't have room for you or time for you, God's okay with that. That's fine. He'll go find another heart. It's interesting in this story when Mary and Joseph go to the inn, they don't argue with the innkeeper. When the innkeeper says there's no room in the inn, they don't argue with him. He says go to the barn, they go to the barn. God is not going to argue with you if you don't have room in your heart. We have to invite him in. And you may feel self-conscious about that at first, but suspend your suspicion and really try it. Just simply ask Jesus to be born in your heart tonight. And believe that he will. You'll begin to feel the presence of God's spirit within you. When you invite him in, you'll begin to feel, it feels like kind of like a rising of love within you, a rising of compassion. You'll feel it happen. So maybe we've been like the innkeeper at times. Maybe we've turned Jesus away. Maybe by our actions we've said, there's no room for you in here. Maybe there's no room for Jesus in the place where we work or in conversations that we have with friends or in the busyness of our family life. Maybe we haven't made room for Jesus. I love the song by the Casting Crowns, that Christian group, and they, they sing the song, and it, it begins with a question. The song starts with simply, is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? You can come as you are. It may set you apart when you make room in your heart and trade your dreams for his glory. That's the question I want to invite us to reflect on tonight. Is there room in your heart? For Jesus. Let us pray. God, we take a moment of silence tonight to reflect on your birth and what it means, how you came into this troubled world, this dark world. <clears throat> you also come into our lives. And so, God, would you be born in our hearts tonight, right now, God, help us to empty our hearts of the things that are unimportant so that we can make room in our hearts for you to be born. Be born in us tonight, God. That would be the greatest gift that we could ever be given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you to take your candle. You should have been given a candle as you, as you came in tonight. And the candle is a, um, it's a symbol for the light of Jesus. It says in the Gospel of John, this is John's uh, version of the birth story of Jesus. He says, a light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. So just repeat that with me. A light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. And so what we're going to do, this is my favorite part of the service, is we, uh, we're going to darken the church. The only light here will be the Christ candle. And I'm going to light my candle from the Christ candle. The ushers will then come down and light their candles from the Christ candle, from my candle. Mm -hmm. And then slowly we're going to see the light of Christ spread through this church. There will be no electric lights on, but all the illumination in here will be from the light of our candles. And what's beautiful about that is it's also a metaphor of how our light spreads. The light of Jesus spreads from one person to another. I also want to ask you, please, to um, make sure to be safe with this, that you dip your unlit candle toward the candle that is lit, rather than the lit candle. And let's uh, stand and sing Silent Night as we watch this light spread, the light of Jesus.
Please join me in the prayer which is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. God of wonder, we have heard this night how women, men, shepherds, kings, and even angels marveled at the birth of your son. May we treasure up all their stories in our hearts and ponder them so that our eyes might be open and our hearts made tender again to the mysteries of your work in our lives and in the world. Amen. Open the end of your heart and let Jesus be born in you again this Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.